Next up, the inappropriately named Lightning Force, Quest for the Dark Star, aka Thunder Force 4 in both Japan and Europe. Released once again by Sega themselves, two years later. Matt Michael, you have the floor. Continuing from where the third offering left off, an all-new residual force and allies of the Orn Empire, Vios, have formed on the planet of Asaria and have once more assaulted the Galaxy Federation, thereby forcing the latter to send out their, their latest, latest Fire, Fire Leo, Leo Type, type 4, 4 battle battlecraft, craft. Rhinex, piloted by Roy S. Mercury and Carol T. Mars, according to the Japanese version, to stage an ultimate fucking retaliation against those habitually intractable sons of bitches. In the words of Ramsey, you beautifully nailed that line on the head there. It's business as usual like the previous outing, except you're now able to determine which order you want to kick off your latest mission. Hence the choice between four different situational areas, Strite, a confrontation near an island as well as underwater, Dazer within a desolated desert, Ruin and Air Raid, as their respective names imply, confrontations that take place within the ruined urban landscape and throughout the dark aqua green skies over that very same landscape in flames. Hence where the new batch of weapons and customary plethora of necessary strategies come in, of course. Regarding the former, apart from the returning twin and backshots in tow, which can be enhanced to both the all new blade and railgun respectively. Railgun. A few newer weapons make the roster alongside the also returning Hunter, most notably the Snake and the Freeway. A row of bombs are dropped, creating a wavy yet slightly linear pattern of explosions, and a spread wave is deployed opposite your desired direction of travel, akin to the aforementioned Nova from TF2, individually. And get this! The Thunder Sword is bestowed upon your Rhinex fighter craft halfway through the game, after enduring the first four areas, whose prerequisites and downsides I'll take up on later. At least the claws and the shield also make their well-deserved return alongside just that one introductory add-on, as they should be self-explanatory by now. Ditto for the usual, if somehow rare, one-ups. In terms of this entry's boss roster, your Rhinox ship must face and crush the piss out of the following without any slip-ups whatsoever. The Gargoyle Diver at the end of the strike scene, the Fomel Hot Android near the end of the Dazer scene, the Hell Arm Attack Fort nearing the end of the Ruin scene, and the Brooding Rat Carrier during the end of the Air Raid scene followed by the Orn Faust, controller of the Vio Space Cruiser and Chaos's right-hand android attacker subordinates during the interstellar dogfight nearby said space cruiser, the Spark Lancer attack craft found near Volvados, aka the Northern Sea of Vios, where numerous ice-based and extraterrestrial creatures are inhabited, the Dust Egg, aka Dust Eag, and the underground lava-filled Desvio Caves, the Evil Core housed in the protected walls of the Biobase, the ginormous, not-to-be-fucked-with armament caught within the actual Biobase itself, and finally, thank God, the return of not only the aforementioned Orn Faust, but also the goddamn Chaos Computer, which is housed within a giant golden crab-like Bios android, thus resembling that of the very same armaments claw. Seriously, if you thought every other tough-ass shmup boss you've faced so far eclipsed them by even the combined lengths of Echoes and Shamu's boners lined up and spread out apart from each other, namely all the core ships in Gradius, the Project 4 trifecta in Capcom's UN Squadron, and even Belzer's Cyborg Fish Squadrons in Taito's Darius franchise, think, think the, the Christ, Christ again, because you haven't seen dick all yet, folks. Who and what we're dealing with here makes even those earlier reference boss enemies look like a meek as fuck, cowardly bunch of kittens abandoned in a dark, lonely alley, in that they'll take endless shitloads upon shitloads of physical executions before, before eventually being exterminated, exterminated to, to jack, jack fucking, fucking shit. shit. And to top it off, adding to our combined levels of seriousness, paraphrasing Manta Ray Vasquez, they'll bash your spine in, rip out your fucking limbs, piss down your eye sockets, and make you look like a fool! Or in my case, make you look like a flat out uneducated deuce guzzling bastard 69 in jackass! Unless, as always, you're well prepared and armed to the gills, expect them to sweep the floor with your ass every goddamn time! Of course, that's where the next acknowledged subject comes in, amongst a few other features that make this game stand out from all the rest and then some, including but not limited to the ever so straightforward and flawless control mechanics and far from monotonous and disappointing gameplay cycle, about which we foresee no impetus to spew out any mindless bullfuck whatsoever. Your thoughts on the challenge, Matt? 
As opposed to the previous two Thunder Force outings, just simply expressing that this game's tough as nails would be considered yet another understatement of the millennium. Lightning Force, aka TF4, is packed with way more than enough shit that'll do way fucking more than make your hair fucking stand on end and instantaneously turn your liver, kidneys, and brains into a goddamn worm buffet. Remember that weapon lineup we were yammering on about earlier? They're a hell of a lot more balanced here compared to those in the same previous two, in that the situational uses of some of them are of much greater aid than others. But the real star of the show is the earlier introduced Thunder Sword for sure. Getting back to said new add-on, there's two important hints to take serious heed of, one of which turns out to be a massive as shit downside due largely to what's about to be stated. A, be sure to have two claws, or craws if you will, affixed to your ship, which by this juncture should appear differently, and don't fire any of your weapons for a while, just wait a few moments for them to charge their inner energy auras and then deploy them, at which point the full effect of the Thunder Sword manifests the hell out of itself and B, even doing so, will leave the Rhinox vulnerable to any and all possible yet unexpected collisions, but even worse still, since this special accessory has an ample recoil effect, expect to run into arbitrary shit often, unless you're attentive enough in your evasion strategies, depending on your fighter craft's speed. Besides that, refer to the same hints that were previously announced regarding Thunder Force 2 and 3, and since you only start off with any amount between 1 to 4 lives, and get this. Upon setting your stock to 0 at the option screen at the beginning, you're automatically supplied 100 from the get-go, but only in the US version, as well as 6 continues this time around. Therefore, I wouldn't let any of them go to unspeakable piles of waste if I were you. Your thoughts on the graphics, Matt? Technosoft really upped the ante like a motherfucker on the overall presentation of this current 16-bit offering in the series, thereby wowing us with its trademark parallax scrolling and the exclusive vertical scrolling features of select areas, akin to Gradius 2 and onward, with the latter allowing the player to oversee the majority of them in a more abundant plateau of detail than ever before, and an even greater deal of freedom in comparison to its predecessors. And don't even get us started about how bright the palettes are for not only the Rhinex ship, but all of the opposing hostile parties it goes up against within most of the surrounding planets it drifts its way through, let alone the ever so diverse and realistic scenery for each planet and or blanket of outer space, which shits uncontrollably all over those of the previous two. Not to mention the obvious cases in which slowdown can occur at rather unnecessary yet somehow beneficial junctures, considering it's not as severe and mind-drenching as Thunder Spirits, most notably the mid and end stage dogfights, and especially the fifth area, when you're infiltrating the Vio space cruiser. Seriously, it's no fucking surprise that many regard this as the console's best looking games it had to offer at the time, next to Biohazard Battle, The Steel Empire, and Soul Dees. Need the Christ we express more? Take a fucking chill pill, Walter Sobchak. In the music and sound department, composed yet again by the returning Gamanishi, this time under the alias Funky Suronin, with Takeshi Yoshida and Naosuke Arai, under the aliases of Omen and Yunker Matai, respectively. This game's latest, varied collection of FM synthesized songs are nothing short of remarkably palatial in every respect, due as a whole to the unparalleled array of thematic moods and vibes, and necessary instrumentation tools applied towards them, from both technical and artistic standpoints alike, of course. Shit, even the participating sound effects are a hell of a lot more convincing than ever, if at some points a tad out of place. Place, especially when every end boss kisses the goddamn canvas. But the voiceover samples, heard as always upon obtaining every weapon or accessory, are made out to be far less intelligible and drowned out by comparison, as tragic as it is to report at this point, in which case you're better off looking the other way. And once again, take note of my top 5 favorites displayed here, with some honorable mentions thrown in underneath. Your thoughts on the replayability, Matt? In spite of the game's rather minor drawbacks that many have been bitching about time and time again, about which won't be repeated except for one, the international titling convention, in that Sega issued a refusal warning towards the long since defunct Tengen care of Atari, or Tengen if so might prefer, despite the latter company's intent to localize it. There's no reasonable ass doubt that Lightning Force, aka Thunder Force 4, is legit, hands down, and low key a timeless shmup classic worth not only owning, but mastering even at the most insanely high difficulty settings it has to offer, complete with more demanding, trial and error worthy tests of patience, attrition and courage than one could shake a fucking stick at. Bottom line, you'd be doing yourself a most regrettable disservice by, by turning, turning this game, game the, the hell, hell down. down! Honestly man, I could have said this shit any goddamn better. Hunter. 
Final exhibit, Thunder Force 5 Perfect System. Released for the PS1 more than half a decade later, except this time it was localized by the short-lived working designs and its bass label. Yes, they're the same folks responsible for bringing over Taito's Raystorm. No shit, right? And now for his first ever debut here alongside yours truly, you may remember him as one of the organizers for Boston Open Screen, not to mention Buff, short for the Boston Underground Film Festival, which I still have yet to visit for the record before I shuffle off my mortal coil, the panel videographer at Rhode Island Comic Con, and most notably Video of the Day at Norcam, and of course The Vampire, and my name is Jonah. Let us all welcome Phil Healy. Shifting our focus from the ongoing war between the Galaxy Federation and the Orn Empire, scientists on Earth have recently captured the Rhinex fighter craft upon its unsuspecting departure into the Sol system. Both a massive man-made island on the moon was constructed, namely Babel, and a supercomputer in the South Pacific, namely Guardian, the latter of whose purpose was to delve into Rhinex's mysteries by deciphering the complex systems of the Vast Steel, that's short for Vastian Steel. Or Vastian Steel if one might prefer. They would do this using reverse engineering and even integrating and upping the ante on the technology that actually made the Rhinox a formidable starfighter craft, at which point every major discovery was credited to the aforementioned Vastillo and Rhinox's countless miracles. In return for Guardian's full consciousness development, the supercomputer starts retaliating against Earth itself, thereby eradicating the United Earth government in a heartbeat. Their last uh, hope, one might ask? A pilot by the name of Senis Crawford and her hotshot Ace Squadron with the introduction of their latest RVR-01 gauntlet battlecraft. They'd rush to confront the actions of the reluctant Guardian supercomputer. Admirably phrased there, Healy. Admirably phrased. Unfortunately, due to Phil's string of numerous personal commitments, which of course won't be further delved into at this time, it's about time someone picked up the goddamn slack around here, and many wonder why the hell I don't work well with others. Anyways, why waste any more time? Concerning the gameplay, I don't even need to repeat myself like an effective analog record regarding the meat of this 32-bit update to Technosoft's sort of thriving, if nearing the brink of a crushing dissipation shmup series. As before, you're selecting the order of missions in which to kick off your quest. No blue, over an endless sea under which an old civilization is submerged. Wood, an experimental forest, and or the human road, a newly developed urban landscape, followed by yet another string of scenery-laden missions, which will be further elaborated in a while. Control setup-wise, while the D-pad or the left analog stick, that is if you've got a dual shock, allows the gauntlet to migrate of its own free will, as expected. X lets it fire off any desired weapon, circle toggles its movement speed in increments of 25, between 50% to 100%, triangle toggles the appearance of the status window at the top, square lets the craft deploy its all-new overweapon, active only when your returning claws, now cross, short for constituted ray art weapons, three of which can be carried here, are gathered and accounted for, and your current starting or special weapons fused with them to make an ultimate and slightly more devastating version. Also, take strenuous note, the cross, while feasible for leveling up your ship and being initially immune to the majority of enemy fire, will turn different colors if the overweapon is deployed too goddamn often, thereby draining their energy levels to absolute jack shit, in which case you're better off either waiting for your orbs to recharge themselves, or replacing one and or all of them after they're crushed out of existence. And of course, L1, L2, R1, and R2 allow you to swap the weapons at any given moment. Getting to the weapons, by the way, the twin and back shots make their well-deserved return, as do the Hunter and the slightly augmented wave shots, complete with the in-game exclusive 360-degree free-range beam, with which you can target any incoming hostile party or large boss in your scope and fry their asses flat out, and the return of the blade and railgun halfway through the mission in Area 4, but only if you're controlling another ship. Shifting our focus back to the remainder of the overall itinerary, not counting the first three mandatory areas, 
In addition to the new end bosses you'll go toe to toe against, your Gauntlet Starfighter craft not only treks through the aptly described large uninhabited artificial island of Babel, on which the research and development facility for Vastil Technology is located, but is later attached to the RVR 02B Brigandine module along with another Starfighter craft, the RVR 02 Vambrace. Remember that other ship I mentioned? Since the former is unable to survive out within the Earth's atmosphere as it approaches yet another all new giant battleship, Judgment Sword, within which the controlling Guardian AI is housed. And let's not get ourselves started about the latter either, the end boss confrontations that is. The Deep Purple at the end of No Blue, not to be confused with the 60s psychedelic band, the A3, short for the armament's armed arm, at the end of the so called Human Road, the Iron Maiden at the end of Wood, the Guardianite at the end of the Underground Babel Caves, the return of the Rhinox craft from the previous Thunder Force, except it's acting violently against your squadron, aka the Vastial Original, is around the pursuit for the aforementioned Judgment Sword while keeping its defending fleet at bay, the Guardian Supercomputer's own AI within said battle cruiser, and finally the core of the Guardian itself, which in true Nam 1975 should come the Forever Man in Time Crisis fashion will result in a shitty outcome if you fail to eliminate the son of a bitch in a timely custom. Just when you thought the combined boss rosters from the last three outings couldn't be any more resilient, these extraterrestrial and mechanical cocksuckers don't pull any punches either. As ever, being aware of how to handle yourself against them, as well as striving to get to them completely unscathed and armed to the gills, is of the utmost motherfucking importance. Therefore, consider yourself while pissing ships creeks without any paddles, should you happen to get tripped up at any given point whatsoever. Before I forget, in true Life Force fashion, you're able to reclaim your craw orbs upon death and instant respawning before they drift off completely. The control mechanics and gameplay scope, as many might expect, have been radically and vastly improved on a scale beyond human comprehension with absolutely no flaws whatsoever, with the obvious exception of some of the other key aspects, of course, continuing with none other than who could have guessed the challenge. And since we're on that subject, if I were to measure Thunder Force 5's difficulty as opposed to its precursors, it would most definitely have to land somewhere smack dab in the middle, precisely being more of a walk in the park than 2 and 4 combined, but slightly harder than 3, in that the all new free range beam is feasible for making instant scrap metal out of every fucking hostile party in your path, ditto for the OP as Christ over weapon renditions of your desired main and sub weapons, taking the previously noted restrictions into consideration of course, and to top it off, while the same hints also previously noted a while ago apply here, they matter a great goddamn deal in the time attack mode, during which you start off fully enhanced and are prohibited from gaining any additional weapons or accessories upon facing each of the end stage bosses, not to mention the fact that a 10 second time deduction will take effect every time your ass gets rubbed out, as well as the much harder modes that command more complete endings and extra contents including more FMV clips and an art gallery, hence the digital viewer feature, since they all turn out to be worth advancing further beyond the standard learning curve. In addition, you're given 3 lives at the beginning, more of which can be acquired as always, by snatching 1 up icons or scoring extra points via the extend systems, and any amount between 1 to 3 continues, another of which is annexed for every 3 hours of playtime, which once again, we can't stress enough in reminding everyone to eschew inadvertently wasting, let alone to bear in mind every imperative ass word to the wise. On the graphical forefront, while many have raved how sparse the presentation is, both in terms of the backgrounds and the in-game sprite designs, the latter at least displays credible enough animations notwithstanding the rather hideous aging and jittery-ass scrolling. I mean, look at the other PS1 shmups that were all the rage around that same time frame, for instance. The aforementioned Raystorm and Ray Crisis both by Taito, also localized by the ill-fated Spaz care of working designs, Square Enix's Einhonder, Irem's R-Type Delta, and even Cygnosis's aka Sony Liverpool's Colony Wars, but I digress. Regarding the former, however, the background elements, that is, this and its original Japan only Saturn counterpart look virtually identical to each other, in spite of their varying effects in terms of both the added transparency effects and the more meticulous and rich ground textures, respectively. Everything else, including the RVR spacecraft designs, the Gauntlet, Vambrace, Brigandine, and even the returning Rhinex, and the vast lineup of opposing adversaries controlled by the Guardian, modest and immense alike, not to mention the attacks that they display, is definitely out of this world, no pun intended. Musically, along with the sound effects, arranged and orchestrated here by a pre-Devil's Engine Hyakutaro Tsukumo, also of Blastwind and Last Duel fame, two other Technosoft games, and the penultimate of which has fuck all to do with flatulence for the record. This prevailing entry's collection of synth rock anthems are anything but an ear rapey cacophonic nightmare or an absolute bore, as every one of them stand out from one another, and set every mood accordingly as they should, ditto for those of all the previous Thunder Force outings, of course, though not close to the likes of Daisuke Ishiwatari, Michiri Yamane, or Tamayo Kawamoto. But yet again, I digress. 
The Japan only Saturn version pretty much shits on this version overall, and I'm expressing this for the sake of all the other shmup diehardies out there. Nothing personal. The participating sound effects are at the very least serviceable, if to some extent dissonance as shit. Likewise for the voiceovers, which I'm more than certain some can do well without, heard as usual, not only whenever any item is obtained, but also at the start of every end boss confrontation. Did I forget to mention that some of the tracks ended up taking melodic cues from some of its predecessors, hence some of the examples provided in my top 5 list about to be displayed in 5. Four, three. And of course, who could forget the usual honorable mentions, right? Replayability wise, although it hasn't caught on as much as the likes of its earlier brethren antecedents, most of what we've discussed so far that Technosoft bothered to bring to the table, this time with the help of the aforementioned long since defunct Spaz care of working designs, localization wise, of course, in terms of the weapon overhaul choices according to which ship you're controlling, an even more lenient scoring system, the time attack mode for optional boss rush practice sections, and even the extra content and difficulty modes you're capable of discovering, dependent on how often one masters it, never mind the previously recounted counted audio-visual deficiencies as opposed to its Japan-only Saturn counterpart, consider these amongst the few other crucial incentives to track down and strap into Thunder Force 5 Perfect System. And for those still sleeping on this cutting-edge franchise, have I got a few words for you. WAKE THE FUCK UP! Allow me to kick off my usual final verdict statement by requesting everyone watching so far to forgive my usual broken record thought and speech patterns in advance. But it should be more than a cinch why this series has been highly appreciated despite not only their individual case-dependent flaws, but also their rocky beginning and end, though in the latter case, there was a Japan-only PS2 sequel made by Sega themselves over a decade ago, hence Thunder Force 6, which was deemed too easy, contained a rather forgettable soundtrack, and relied way too heavily on recycled innovations and homages from its mini predecessors, and even the much earlier half-assed attempt at a true follow-up, specifically Factory Noise and AG's Broken Thunder, which, apart from integrating a uniquely pre-produced soundtrack, was pulled from Japanese store shelves in one fell swoop due to its mediocre-ass design on the promise that the game would be eventually fixed, but even that never came to be. But for the absolute last time, I digress. Anyways, on a scale of 1 to 10, here's how I rate them all. Even considering these duly recorded statistics, and while others favor the former three more than the latter, even by today's standards, neither of those nor the multitude of statements could possibly bring to form how I strongly recommend this radical yet brutally difficult shmup series, which even trumps the ever-loving shit out of Williams Defender and Rare Solar Jetman any day. But then again, I'm just fucking with everyone. But seriously, I'd get my ass out there if I were you, and indulge myself into one intense interstellar altercation after another with Thunder Force. There won't be a diminutive raindrop of shame whatsoever in doing so, trust me. Before I go, let me just take this golden opportunity and thank both Matt Michael and Phil Healy in his first ever show debut for rolling through with yours truly through yet another trip down memory lane. Applause, please? <laughs> Yeah, just beautiful. Anyways, until then, this is the one and only Hardcore Retro God proudly and triumphantly signing off.
Thank <laughs> you. 